Hi, I'm Mitch, and welcome to the Restoration Road. Today we have the opportunity to speak with one of the most remarkable people I've ever met. It's Judge Wendy Davis, and today she's going to share how she applies her faith to her job as Allen County Superior Court Judge of the Criminal Division. Judge Wendy Davis, thank you so much for being with us. Welcome. Very few people, when they see you on the outside, would know how tough you can be on the inside. But uh, you're a judge, Allen County Superior Court Judge in the Criminal Division. Correct. And um, I, I first want to talk about your bracelet right here. <laughs> Tell me the story behind that. You nailed that. me with my bracelet. <laughs> well, um, this bracelet was given to me by my sister, actually my sister-in-law, who I went to Wheaton College with. So I, she now, my best friend turned sister-in-law. But um, yes, it's Romans that tells me all things work together for good for those that love Christ. And she, so she gave me this bracelet about three years ago. Not only is it a pretty big bracelet, but um, I wear it every single day, even on the bench. On the bench, to you To remind me mm -hmm, that all things can work together for good for those that, that love Christ. So, Do you ever get asked about it? I do get asked about it. In fact, um, you know, it's, it's, I don't ever talk about it. I don't ever, um, but I've had lawyers actually when I'm off the bench, because sometimes when they approach the bench and we're talking, because I have a black robe on, I, they can't really see anything I'm wearing <laughs> but my bracelet. And so um, I've had lawyers ask me about it when I'm off the bench and they'll say, Judge Davis, can I see your bracelet? I saw it and I'll just say, yep, and I'll show it to them. Mm. So it's a quiet way, I, I suppose, that I can um, tell those that I work with and those that are around me, uh, where my true heart and faith is. Well, I know you believe that God has brought you to this position for a reason. I do. Uh, I was a lawyer for almost 21 years um, prior to taking the bench, and um, I was a prosecutor. I was on a state and federal uh, violent crimes task force for a while, doing a lot of uh, violent crimes and some capital murders. As a prosecutor, um, I was in private practice for a very long time in federal court. My private practice was mostly in federal court federal court. So all of that combination kind of led me to run in an election. And I will never forget um, when I was thinking about running. I, I always had it in my heart that I would want to be a judge. And um, really? years, I did. That's well, when I went to law school, when yeah. I went to law school. Uh -huh. And I think every everybody, or not everybody, many lawyers, when they're in law school or lawyers, they always kind of dream to be a judge. Now, there's other lawyers that say, I would never want to be a judge because, um, you know, you go from advocate as a lawyer, you're an advocate to a decision maker. And some people don't like that role of decision neutral decision maker, mm -hmm. um, being that decision maker. But... Um, I had an opportunity um, years and years ago, I was asked to throw my hat in the ring for a federal bench. And that really kind of got the wheels churning that I was going to move in that direction. Um, and the federal process is a bit different. That was an appointment. That would have been an appointment sure. by the president. Um, but then this came, I had an opportunity then to run in an election here in Allen County. And that was a huge decision for me and for my family um, to kind of put myself out there. And then, you know, it, it just to sit down and, and ask God, what's next in my life? Sure. Is this it? Is sure. this the next step? So it's interesting to have the kind of faith that I have and want to be the kind of person that I want to be, um, and that is one with integrity always, and to run through an election because if you want someone to start stabbing at that integrity and character, run in an election. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. Yeah, I used to want to be in politics, and then I sinned a little bit, and I decided, well, I don't want that all coming right. up again. Right, right. Um, Got to have thick skin, <laughs> that's for sure. One of the things I always tell my kids, especially my teenagers, I say, you know, how you deal with hard people in life, how you deal with hard situations in life, mm -hmm. that defines you. Absolutely. That really defines who you are. And you can't control... The world. You can't control other people and what they say and what they do, but you can control yourself. And so I guess all of the things I had been preaching to my kids about how you react to hard situations or people that might say bad things about you defines who you are. All of a sudden, I hear my teenage daughter going, Mom, how you react in this election will define you. And I thought, she's spot on. Mm. That is so good. Yeah. Uh, Shirley Woods, who has an unbelievable ministry in Fort Wayne. I know, Fort Shirley, Wayne. yes. She, I love Shirley. Yes. She was on She's this like an show. angel in our community, she candidly. Is. She is. She was on this show, and she talked about losing her son to adult mm -hmm. SIDS. And she said, it wasn't the mountaintop, but it was the valley where I grew most in my intimacy with God. Mm -hmm. And there's this uh, 
a passage in Kings in the Bible that says, because you thought God was just the God of the mountaintop and not the God of the valley, hey, it's not going to work out so well for you. I'm, I'm, pra- I'm paraphrasing. but um, And when none of us really want to be in those valleys. No, we don't. <laughs> I mean, I would, I, if, I, if I had my prayer to the Lord, I'd be, why don't you teach me when I'm on the top of the mountain? And, uh, <laughs> and you know, I, <laughs> you know. Unfortunately, though, because my heart is Christ and I lay my life at the foot of the cross, he's in, he's in charge of that, so mm-hmm. not is. me. But that's excellent. That's true. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. In fact, I realized uh, one time I was praying, and um, my grandfather, my great-grandfather used to pray on his knees, uh, and he told my dad to pray on his knees. And one day when I was five years old, I was walking by his bedroom, and I saw my dad on his knees. I asked him what he was doing, and he said, I'm, it's kind of hard for me to get out now. He, he said, I'm praying on my knees. He said, uh, my grandfather told me it's a picture of humility on the outside of what you're doing on the inside. Oh. And uh, I've never forgotten that. But I realized as I was praying, it was all for my comfort and my abundance. Yeah. And uh, I got convicted about that. And I started to ask myself, well, what would happen if I would pray for what God wants? You know, and, and so then I started studying what did Jesus pray for? And so it's really that those concepts are really transformed my prayers, I guess. Right. And they're good to remember, because I think oftentimes when we go when we pray, you know, Lord, give me this, give me that. Please let my day go well. Be with my children. You know, do all these things. You know, in, in my position every day, give me you know wisdom today, mm-hmm. which I continue to pray. But instead of kind of always remembering, Lord, what is your will? What is your will for my life? What is your will for this day? What is your will for my kids? Oh, that's um, and I know that's hard because for someone who's now in a job that I'm always in control. <laughs> Um, you realize um, as much as I think I'm in control of my courtroom and decisions that I make for um, the community and for the you know, criminal offenders, um, when you relinquish your heart and life to Christ, you also relinquish that control. So that's sometimes it's really hard when you're saying... Your will be done, not my own. It's hard for control people. Oh, yes, it <laughs> That's is. It's hard for me. And I can't tell you how many times, I mean, even when I get, like, in a situation like this, you know, that instead of thinking I'm going to control this, but really when you realize why maybe I was asked to come here today, it's the prayer should be, Lord, less of me and all of you. Mm. How do you grow in your wisdom, especially in the position you're in? I mean, do you go to the, the Word of God? Do you uh, read a whole lot more about, uh, case law, like how do you grow in your wisdom so you have it to apply it when you're there? That's kind of a loaded question. If you're asking me how I do it in my role as a criminal court judge, um, candidly, I think as judges, um, just objectively, I'm, I'm always learning. I'm learning from my colleagues. Um, I have two colleagues in the criminal division that have been great mentors to me. Mm. Um, I'm always looking for the law. You know, as the judge, I feel like I need to be one or two steps ahead of the lawyers yes. um, as far as the law. So we, I always ensure that, you know, whatever new cases come down, whatever new laws come down. In fact, interestingly, um, here in Indiana, our criminal code is getting ready to get completely revamped. Mm. And so I've already been studying. It, it's still a bill, but it's coming. And so obviously I've been studying that bill to make sure I have a really good grasp of the law because in my role, um, I have to be, I have to know that law. I have to know it and I have to know how to apply it. Um, so that's one way I think that just realistically and practically speaking as a judge, um, I always have to be a step ahead um, when, the, when the law comes into place. As far as though the actual decision making, you know, there's often times where, you know, I hear the lawyers make their arguments. I have an offender sitting in my courtroom that's usually really a pretty broken human being. Um, because obviously he's here now and, and committed crimes. And I've got oftentimes victims, you know, victims of a crime. Mm-hmm. And so when you have to put all that together, especially in sentencing these offenders, um, there are times when I can do all of my homework. I can know the law. I can know everything I need to know about this offender because prior to sentencing, um, I get confidential information about the offender. So I know... When, how the offender grew up, what their family life was, their criminal history. I know everything there is to know about that offender. So I have all of my homework in place, but sometimes, Mitch, it's just that added, Lord, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom at this moment. Well, you know, in my preparatory work before sentencing or whatever, um, just to do the right thing, the right thing to keep my community safe and the right thing for Allen County and Indiana and then the right thing for the people involved, whether it be the offender or the victims. 
um, to ensure that I make good decisions. So. so you pray and ask for it. I do. That's excellent. I do. I really do. And it's, so it's cool. funny because I actually thought, am I going to say that out loud? And <laughs> I, but, you know, it's the truth. And so if I'm living in the truth, I mean, again, you know, um, I believe that God puts us in positions of puts all you know puts us in positions of leadership or wherever we are in our life. Mm-hmm. He puts us in those positions. What we do with those positions, though, define us. Mm-hmm. And so I think that above all else, I have to make sure I'm always on the cutting edge and reading and studying and learning the law and and making sure I'm the most prepared individual in the courtroom. That I'm never caught off guard as the, as the judge, but in the same token, I can be as prepared as I can be. Sometimes I still have to make very tough decisions, and so when those tough decisions um, need just that added nudge, um, it's really nice to know that I can count on God's wisdom as well. It's interesting. Proverbs says there's no wisdom, no insight that can stand against the Lord, and that's in the book of wisdom. So you, uh, no matter what we do, it's just what you just said. No matter how educated we are, no matter how much we know about what we're doing, um, God is still God, and the the definition of wisdom is predicated on a fully surrendered relationship with him we're very much applying his heart to our circumstances so at the end of the day if we don't ask him we're kind of missing the idea we're trying to take principles void of a personal relationship with him and it's funny that you talked about seeing your dad just that picture remember on his knees and humility um because with, you know, in Proverbs, it also says with humility comes great wisdom. Mm-hmm. And so I think about that. 11-2. <laughs> 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 now, Mitch, I'm supposed to be more stoic than this. I'm sorry, no. Judge. <laughs> Your Honor. <laughs> but what I was going to say is that, um, is that, you know, as we, as we walk through life, I mean, half the time when you talk about I'm on my knees and I'm praying, I, I, I have to tell you what I was thinking about. I'm thinking, okay, I have three children. My husband is busy. I'm pretty busy in the criminal division. I've got soccer games and this. I've got a full calendar. I'm in a jury trial. Half the time when I'm praying, it's in the car. I turn the radio off, and I'm like, oh, it's quiet. Okay, Lord, blah, 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 blah. and I'm thinking, if I had time to get on my knees, so maybe that's something that I need to think about because oh, that's awesome. half the time I'm thinking, Wow, just to have that peace and quiet in my own home, to be on my knees. That's awesome. Yeah. To me, you are one of the most unique females on the planet. Oh, my. I mean, <laughs> think about uh, what you've been through and, and, and who you are and where you are. I mean, it's just incredible. So i kind of like to see if we can figure out uh, some defining moments that you're talking about. You know, it's interesting because I guess one of the most fortunate things that I'm thankful for is uh, my family and my parents. You know... In the position I'm in now, in, in sitting on a criminal court pen, bench, only dealing with felonies. That's all. So, a felony offenders, and so, I see the brokenness of the families and the homes. And how does a 40 year old get to their, you know, eighth felony? A 40 year old. You know, I'm 47. So, and you can date it all the way back, probably to, to how they were raised and grown up. I mean, not always, but typically. And so, I was very fortunate. Um, I had a mother and father who loved Christ. Um, they taught all of us kids in our home. Um, We had a very grounded home. And my father, who many people know in this community, L.D. Williams, came from an extremely humble beginnings. Um, If, if, well, if he watches this show, I suppose I need to be careful, but he was just a hillbilly. I mean, you know, he tells stories of, you know, having indoor plumbing when he was 16, finally, and, um, you know, driving cars up in the Ozarks when he was 14, and, you know, that kind of thing. So really came from humble beginnings and met my mother. And so um, he has really done well for himself and kind of living the American dream, you know, really worked hard, put himself through school, got a PhD. So my father was not only a strong Christian man, but my father was an extremely driven man, Um, kind of, if I can say, driven to get out of the culture of the environment that he grew up in. Not that it wasn't a loving environment, it just to get out and succeed is is kind of the world um, success would do it. But all along the way, he taught all of us kids Nothing else matters in life. No power, no prestige, no money if you don't love Christ. And he also taught us, um, you know, be kind to anybody that's a janitor all the way up to the CEO. And 
um, I get a little choked up, I guess, talking about my dad. Um, so, so I came from a household like that. And so I was very fortunate that I came from, and I have two parents that are still married um, after 51 years. Oh my. Yes, and so that's a huge success it in today's is. world. And so I grew up, I became a Christian when I had a young age. I became baptized at a young age. Um, I think off camera, you and I joked a bit, that does not mean I've walked through my life. <laughs> <laughs> unscathed. Um, I went I to understand. Homestead High School, and I'm sure <laughs> anyone, <said>. yes, <laughs> I'm sure anybody watching this right now that went to high school with me thought she she was a Christian. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> That's awesome. So, um, but anyway, went to Wheaton College, found, found my way back to the Lord. And, uh, what you a know, great place. Yes, it is a great place. And I met my husband, um, who is a physician here in town. He, um, and him and I together, he was in the military. So, what happened was he was a military physician for um, many years after college, which mm. took us down to Texas and continued to grow. San Antonio, Texas. He, we were based there. He was deployed different places as a military physician. But um, so we were there and um, grew in my faith all along the way. You know, when, when, even though you're saved at a young age, that does not mean that you've lived this life pleasing to the Lord, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I have really learned through my life um, what it means to honor God just in the way I live. Um, my, I guess the way I would like to live my life now, having this, the foundation I've had, having Christ, is I guess to lead by example more so than always shouting from the mountaintops, you know, I'm a Christian because we can all say we're Christians and that, and that we love Christ. I think it's kind of one of those things, what does your actions show? Mm -hmm. But even saying that out loud, I think, gives me a lot of accountability that I may not always live up to. So well, we all fall short. But yes. I think it's you bring up a really good point. Um, in fact, I think when the Bible talks about walking worthy, uh, so in essence, your walk's going to match your talk. It's a picture of the scales of justice. I think it's mm -hmm. axios, worthy is axios. That's an interesting, yeah. And so your walk needs to match your talk. Right. But you know what I love is that you talk. I think that's powerful because you're communicating Christ, not just with your actions, but with your words when, when well, you can. I, I have to tell you, Mitch, um, believe it or not, if I get a bit vulnerable, when you asked me to do this, I thought, oh, gosh, if I go on camera and then people know my faith, mm -hmm. that really holds me accountable when I walk back into the world mm -hmm. and I live my life. Um, and I don't know, maybe that's God. Maybe that's God saying, mm, let's straighten up there. You want people to know your faith and how much you love me, you better start living it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it, it's uh -huh. true. I mean, so I can say those words to walk the walk or, you know, to walk, walk the talk. Um, but that's, that is a daily struggle and I think a daily development mm -hmm. in all Christians. No matter if I live to be 100, I'll still be sitting here saying, oh, I'm still learning. Yeah. I'm still stumbling. God's still teaching me. Um, but I'm very fortunate too because I married a man who also has the same foundational beliefs as I do. And I think that makes a huge difference as we raise our own family. Yeah, now. there's no competition in how you do that. Um, that's why I call it Restoration Road because it is a journey. Mm -hmm. I think the Bible clearly talks about it being a process yes. and that we are going to fall short even as believers. But how did you decide you wanted to be an attorney? Where did that start? <laughs> and then especially the criminal part, you want to be the tough guy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Well, I, um, I went to Wheaton College and they got an opportunity um, towards my end of my college to go work on Capitol Hill with Senator Luger. And so that was like in the 80s. Mm. And I realized then when I was working with uh, Senator Luger in, on Capitol Hill that almost every uh, every legislature, it seemed like at the time went to law school. You know, Senator Luger went to law, everybody was going to law school. Yes. If you look at our senators even in Indiana, yes. Senator Long went to law school, you know, they're lawyers. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of went to law school thinking, do I really want to be a lawyer or do I want to be in public administration? But my first year of law school, we take criminal law. And I was one of those that sat there and said, I want to do criminal law. I want to be a prosecutor. I want to, and I've is never done. Is that the athlete in you coming out? Probably. <laughs> but I just thought, this is what I want to do. I want to, you know. And so as soon as I graduated from law school, we went to Texas. I had my first job with um, the federal government, with um, the assistant district, with the, uh, excuse me, um, the federal prosecutor's office in Texas, which led into a state prosecutor position, and then worked my way through the trial courts and ended up getting appointed to a federally funded drug and violent crimes task force where I got to do, gosh, all kinds of 
um, almost all the homicides, gang activity, drugs, guns, that kind of thing, mm. um, and really learned a lot, learned how to be tough. When we moved back to Fort Wayne and when my husband left the military, um, I left the prosecutor's office and went into private practice and was a civil federal litigator for 13 years at Beckman Lawson. But interestingly, <clears throat> I was a full-time partner in this law firm and Karen Richards, our elected prosecutor, came back to me and her and I started talking and she said, do you want to come back to the prosecutor's office even part-time and try cases? Because wow. I think as a trial lawyer, you get that fire in your belly. Yeah. And I just, I thought I would never go back to blood, uh, blood and guns and I couldn't stay away. So I went back to the prosecutor's office part-time, still as a full-time partner at, at Beckman Lawson and started trying cases again. And it was about five years after that that then I ran for judge. Amazing. Yeah. That is so interesting. <laughs> so now I want to tell me about Hope. Okay, uh, Hope Probation. You, yep, yeah. and then your passions uh, on the bench. So Hope Probation is a probationary program for the nonviolent offenders, the mm. lower grade nonviolent offenders that are finding themselves really caught up in a world of drugs. And then a lot of times they steal, they'll steal money or they're, they're, they'll steal other things to go get more drugs and they find themselves with no family no jobs oftentimes their kids are taken away from them and so the query to the judge is they're felon because heroin cocaine controlled substances in our in our country and in our state are felonies so do i lock them up with the murderers and the child molesters or do i figure out a way to truly rehabilitate them. Wow. Hope Probation, basically what it is, it's a very high maintenance program where I am their chief probation officer. I will give them one more shot. If they have to call in every day on a hotline, I give them extensive substance abuse counseling. They have to get a job. Um, so I monitor them so closely. If I let them back out into the community, um, knowing that they have no, no violence in their background, mm -hmm. nor do they have a propensity. Most of the offenders that I put on HOPE probation, um, it's, like I said, it's just an intensive probationary program that I'm the, hope, I'm the chief probation officer. Um, basically, they're individuals that I have done um, an objective analysis on through my, through my experts that then give me the information through reports that say they don't have a propensity to hurt anybody. They have a propensity to continue their drug addiction mm -hmm. unless they get some real help. So it's basically court-ordered help. And um, I have to say, it, the program has been running now almost two years, and we've had great success. Oh, that's we awesome. Have had great, but I, I, I have to say, I have great success through the program, not because of me, because of the collaborative efforts, I, I have to say, with the probation department, the sheriff here in Allen County, because what happens is if these drug addicts, if they test dirty, because I test them once a week, if they test dirty, or if they're not doing what they're supposed to be, if they fall out of line at all, I, I send a warrant out and a warrants officer goes and picks them up and takes them into custody and they have to come back and talk to me. So I have to have the sheriff's office on board. I mean, this program, Hope Probation, I've been so fortunate because it's working. We're keeping a lot of these offenders out of, out of prison, getting them clean and sober, working and back with their families. But I couldn't do it without, again, collaborative efforts of the probation department, the sheriff. It's, there's a lot of tentacles that I direct on this program that have been really, really helpful. And, you know, the sheriff could have said, no, nah, Judge Davis, I'm not going to do that for you. And he's been very wonderful about that. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, you're passionate about young people. Very. You want to help them make wise choices yes. so they don't end up in your courtroom. Yes, how, I do. How are you involved in that? <clears throat> um, one of the things I, real, I realize being an adult court judge, because I don't do juveniles, but I see a lot of 18, 19, 20-year-olds that come in. Um, has driven my passion even more. And this, this started before I got on the bench. I'm on the board of Youth for Christ. Um, I am a member of the Urban Task Force here locally. Um, I am the chairman of the board of United Way here in Allen County. I've tutored inner city kids many times. After third grade, all the statistical analysis says that you are reading to learn. Mm. Most of these kids, though, that get caught, that they have nobody at home to tutor them. They're not forcing them to do what they need to do. If they don't know how to read by third grade, Mitch, what happens is then they just kind of go on through school and they end up dropping out. They end up, they're making D's and F's because they've never really given the educational uh, background. Additionally, so many of the offenders that I see now that I sentence in my courtroom as adults committing adult crimes and felonies, I've said this millions of times, we have to catch these youth before they get to an adult and before they get into my courtroom because once they get to my courtroom 
community safety is first and foremost, sure. and I'm going to do what I have to do in order to make my community safe and to obey the laws. And especially if you're a violent offender, you know, I mean, there's just no way. But so much of, of who these individuals are in the courtroom starts way back when they're young, whether their parents are divorced, whether there's a single mom just trying to do the best she can, working two jobs. You've got a child that sometimes can get lost, and maybe the parent's doing the best they can do. Or there's others where maybe one parent is in prison and the other one is an addict, mm -hmm. and these kids then grow up on the street. And there is nobody to yank them back and say, wait, whoa, you know, come over here and I'm going to be your mentor and I'm going to teach you how to read and I am going to direct you. I know your life is hard, but life is hard. God is good. Yeah. So, you know, you, I just feel like we need more people passionate about, you know, as we look in our community and we see all the shootings. I mean, you read the newspaper, all the shootings, all the stuff I'm dealing with in criminal court, all the drugs um, that we're dealing with. So much of it, I think, I mean, I've been asked, Judge Davis, what are you doing to help the problem? And I want to almost say, well, once, they, once they're here, problem solved. I can take care, I can take it from there once they're in my courtroom. We've got to go all the way back as a community and, and basically say, where are all these kids and youth that are, that are growing up without families, that are growing up without fathers? Um, oftentimes, I have offenders in my courtroom, and they'll, they'll say, oh, I've got, and this is true, I've got eight kids with eight different women. Or I have a, a, a woman, I've got three kids with three different fathers. And so these kids are so lost in the sense of where is the father, where is the mother? The mother right there is in front of me locked up. The father maybe is locked up. Who is raising these children? So I, I do, I, I could go on and talk about this for a long time. It's I obviously feel your passion. I have the same passion with my own kids. And they are first. I mean, I have to tell you, they're first before my community's kids. But I am teaching them as well to walk alongside with me because they're growing up in a household much like I did where in they've got a mother and a father. We love them. We love Christ. We're going to teach them that. Mm -hmm. We're going to teach them to, you know, my kids are athletes, so, you know, they work hard and they're successful. They're good academically. They work hard. They make good grades because of our household. So I feel like I have to teach my kids, look out there. Don't focus on yourself so much. Come alongside me as your mom and let's go help them. You know, because I think my kids need to see it too. You know, they're still growing up themselves, so they need me to be their mother. But I don't want them to be so self-focused that they forget what a good life they have to focus their efforts on others um, and to give back to the community as they grow up. Wendy, what you just said there, and really over the, the last uh, half hour, scripture has just oozed out of your <laughs> mouth. Not and, really. and, and I don't think you do it intentionally. You're giving me too much credit. I mean, it's just amazing. I, we are so blessed to have you in the position of leadership you're in in this well, thank community. You. We love you to pieces. Thank you thank so you. much for being here thank today. Thank you, Mitch. It was my pleasure. Thank you.